hard assisted liposuction and we're gonna do liposuction to this area. But I'm gonna predict, I told you this is gonna be bloodless, right? So you'll see what it is, but it's always bloodless. So we, if this is something predictable. I'm actually gonna be teaching how to do this procedure and not only this, but all procedures in a bloodless manner. And notice how uh, I'm ambidextrous, but this is my non-dominant hand. So I can do this with my left hand, right? Because I'm, I'm right-handed. Uh, and it's actually very good. I think any surgeon can do this very safely, even if they're not ambidextrous, because the way I do this is so soft, right? So controlled. There is, like, I think that this only, not only protects the patient, right, from uh, internal organ injury, right? Uh, which I believe happens, you know, to the surgeon that's going at full speed at the end of the day, fatigue, perhaps after doing many cases on a Friday afternoon, and uh, loses uh, situational awareness. Like, like when you're flying a plane and you, you get lost, you don't know where you are. Um, but, it, or when you're driving a car, probably you can relate to that better. When you're driving a car, and you're going so fast and maybe you're tired or uh, didn't sleep well or whatever and you lose control of the vehicle and you go to an area where you don't supposed to go. You go off the road, right? And I think that's what happens when you perforate an internal organ, right? And that's something that has never happened to me, thanks to God. But I, I believe that it would be almost impossible for anybody using this technique to perforate an organ, even if you're using your non-dominant hand, if you do it this way. Because because I, I believe this is like an electric toothbrush, you know? You don't have to go at it, you know? Uh, when you do that, then there is gonna be gum bleeding, right? Um, similar also to a bullet, right? If you put a bullet and you throw it from one hand to the other, nothing is gonna happen, right? But if you put that bullet on a pistol and you throw it to and you shot it to the other hand there is going to be bleeding so the speed that the doctor the motion that the doctor do are very important proper anesthesia so we use to mess an anesthesia uh, to to do this procedure and it's incredible look at that thank you yeah so this is like a like a toothbrush electric toothbrush see if you if you have an electric toothbrush, you don't have to go at it. You know, uh, you can just let the tool do its work, and and that's basically what I do here, right? I I let the tool do its work, right? And I don't have to, uh, you know. But some surgeons, you know, and some people do. They have the electric toothbrush and they go at it anyways, right? So if you do that, it, you know, I think it defeats its purpose, right? you're basically going to have bleeding but if you want to learn how to do this procedure in a bloodless manner please uh, give us a call and you know you'll see that these patients this very yellow pot that we get over here is what's going to go into her bottles right so uh, yellow pot not red so as a result of it the fat graft retention uh, is greater why well because you're putting yellow pot you know you're not putting blood in it if you put blood into the bottles, then that blood is, is gonna resorb, right? And then your bottles are gonna be smaller, right? So this is the way we do it here, the cosmetic suit for thermal cerebral. And also you have much less tissue irritation, you know, from the trauma, much less risk of seroma, which is a collection of fluid, uh, some, something that we almost never see, right? Um, and uh, much less risk of oil cysts because when you use aggressive cannulas and when you go at these very, very hard, um, you're gonna disrupt the fat cell and uh, there's gonna be oil. And so that oil, the, the body rejects and it creates an oil cyst in your body, something we never have. Also possibly uh, the blood. Yeah, so when the, when the blood is outside the blood vessels, where it's supposed to be, it's irritating to the tissues, and the tissues react to it like uh, you would 
in the case, for example, of the breast implant, when there is a little bit of blood around the breast implant, you, you form a capsular contracture. In other words, like a scar tissue uh, around it, right? And I believe this is the same for, for this case. Thank you. So much less risk of complications, right? Even the blowout fracture, the famous blowout fracture, for those who are not doctors and don't know what that is, it's like a it's like an out pouch that forms on the bottles, right? So it deforms the bottles, it's like a light bulb that sticks out, right? And uh, I believe that's also because uh, the the body is rejecting uh, blood. Uh, usually, and it's you know pushing it out like it would push out a, a piece of glass, or a, it's called a foreign body reaction, or a bullet that's that's not supposed to be where it is. Thank you. So this is also very comfortable for the, the surgeon, and it limits the amount of uh, injuries that the surgeon may have. And you may think, well, how is the surgeon going to injure himself? Well, from repetitive motion, especially if you go very fast at it, you can get tendinitis, right? So you have problems with your, your, your elbow, your shoulders, more commonly, but also your wrist. But if you do this, and, and then the surgeon may be sweating it too, you know? And maybe even contaminating the, the patient with their sweat because they're at it, you know? Like they're going to the gym with this thing. So that's what happens, and it's good for the patient and the surgeon. Thank you. All right, so this is the pinch test. She's on her side. Can you see the, the waist that we gave her? And now this is the pinch test. So we're gonna see how there is absolutely no excess spot anywhere we pinch here. See, that's the pinch test. So that's what we do here. Down to nothing, right? Look at this, see, all over. Thank you. Patient is on the lateral diffuses. You saw that waist that I gave before? Yeah. Now, we're gonna start here, we're just getting started. So, but notice the, the we're getting started on the other side. But Whoa, look at that fast. And you may think, you know what, it's gonna take a long time going so slow, but our times are extremely efficient, especially because we don't have to uh, process that part. Yeah. That part, huh? The part you see there, Nicholas? Yep, that's, that's what's, what's going, going in go. the booty. Yeah, so pay attention to stay tuned so you see what goes into her buttocks is this yellow, beautiful fat, and notice how comfortable and relaxed I am and how gentle I am with the tissues. So it's a combination of things. You want bloodless surgery like this, it's not a secret, okay? What, what do we do? We tell the patient not to take any aspirin-like medications for two weeks before. There's a huge list of blood thinners, including vitamins, herbs, teas of any kind. The surgeon himself, me, I never give any blood thinners, you know, or aspirin-like medications, or even Motrin, that, or, you know, all those medications make you bleed. Some doctors prescribe Motrin for you, right? Um, who do these procedures. Some, some doctors even give an oxoparin, and that's very common. And there is no way you're gonna get this beautiful aspirin like that, because those are blood thinners, and yeah, you can't do it like that. It, and the reason why the doctors give the blood thinners, and that's commonly accepted practice, is so that the patient doesn't get a blood clot. Because a blood clot is the one thing that can kill the patient, right? And so, because the patients normally are in severe pain, they cannot walk, and they're a setup for a blood clot. And especially if you travel for surgery, and then you get on top of a, you know, <laughs> on a plane, and you're sitting for hours with all the restrictions. Nowadays, they don't even let you walk. So yeah, in those cases, I would agree. If you're gonna be in severe pain and not walking, and if you're traveling or whatever, yeah, definitely get a, a you know a blood thinner. But we don't need it, even if our patients were to to travel, because we tell them you know not to travel by air or ground for more than two and a half months after the procedure, right? But uh, uh, but if you do travel, you gotta walk. You can go to China. And you know, you can go to Australia or whatever, and 13 hour flight, not a problem, as long as you're walking. If you're the flight attendant and you're walking, that's totally okay. The problem is sitting. If you're sitting for more than two hours at a time, you can get a blood clot. You get a blood clot, can go to your lung and kill you. 
I never had anybody die. I want to keep it that way, right? But uh, so that's that's critical. So we don't use blood thinners to prevent a blood clot because the best way to prevent a blood clot is not so much the compression boots that we use, which by the way, we use thigh high compression boots because 80% of the blood clots come from above the knee. Although I understand that there is studies that show that even if you put the compression boot on the arm, it works, right? Yeah, but I don't accept the the high uh, risk of thromboembolism. Ours is way, way lower. And so, and I believe it's because our patients walk. Our patients walk, why? Because they don't have pain. I tell my patients to walk one mile the first day, two miles the second day, three miles the third day. But let's say I forgot, okay? I didn't tell them. You know, they're gonna find something to do because they, they get bored. Uh, they have no pain, they're gonna go shopping, they're gonna go to the beach, they're gonna go for a walk and prevent a blood clot. That's the way it works. But it's because they don't have much pain. Why they don't have much pain? Because the, the, the numbing medicine that we put here. Yeah, so you, 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 you prevent a blood clot because you don't have pain. When you don't have pain, you walk. Why? Because this numbing medicine, this numbing medicine that we put here uh, lasts for 48 hours. You know, I put a, a video of this woman that had a tummy stuck and went up 40 stairs and it's on YouTube. And what a, a nurse commented on it that it's impossible that the patient should be bending over in severe pain. There's no way she's going to be not even stay, standing straight. But I said, well, look at the thousands of testimonials that we have on YouTube. And you'll see how uh, the great majority of our patients actually do that, right? But they do it because they don't have pain. If they have pain, I can tell them, walk for a the first day, two months, the second day three months the third day, and they're not gonna do it. Uh, and they're gonna be thinking, oh, that doctor, he's cruel. He wants me to do this and that. And, with, with, and they're correct, because the pain is severe, right? But with us, the patients have zero to two pain, or very minimal pain, allows them to come here the next day for evaluation, allows them to walk, and prevent a blood clot, which is the most lethal complication, right? So that's, that's the bottom line. Thank you. Okay, and another secret, and it's not a secret, but another key for those doctors watching out there, if you want to get a, a, a procedure like this, well, you know, give us a call. I'd be happy to teach you how to, to get consistently this type of yellow, beautiful aspirin. Unstained, goes into the buttocks this way. But one of the keys is to do plenty of tumescent anesthesia in all levels. Not just to give one liter for the belly and one liter from the back, which is what a lot of doctors do, and start right away five minutes later. No, you know we use five and six liters of anesthesia, and you know we put it in all areas, right? And um, and we wait an hour before we even start the procedure. So all those things, and the reason why I'm saying this is because this is the second area, right? And look at this; it's even better, I think. The fact we notice that the longer you lift it to massive anesthesia in there, the better it is. So uh, the the last area for us is the is the is the one that has the least amount of blood. Although I mean there is no blood here, so it's uh, it's almost but incredible. And, and normally when you do liposuction, the opposite happens. The last area is the is the bloodiest, right? But not with us here because this is a different and special technique. But I tell it and I, I teach it to surgeons here. We have workshops so you can come and learn how to do this and you know, not only have less complications, less risk, less pain, less bruising, less bleeding, less risk of uh, oil cysts and less risk of uh, uh, blowout fractures, uh, less risk of uh, internal injury. We never had anybody die. We never had any internal injury to any patient. Thanks to God, we want to keep it that way, right? So, and, but also less injury to the doctor, less risk of tendinitis, uh, you know, tennis elbow. So what color is that pot, Nicholas? Oh, it's a beautiful yellow, a very almost pale yellow, like white. Incredible, almost like neon. Like yeah. Yellow. Incredible, thank you. What color is that, Nicholas? Beautiful yellow fat. And we're doing it under ultrasound guidance. This Woo! is exactly what I told you. This, this fat has not been processed in any way. And it is looking absolutely gorgeous. 
is pure fat, so of course all that fat is going to be retained, right? Because it's pure fat. There is it's not red. Any anybody can tell this. Even a child, you can see. You know, we're looking at an ultrasound too. So I look at the patient. I look at the ultrasound, right? And put in the right place. All right, so we have a beautiful ultrasound here today. This is the patient's deep gluteal fascia, which means that under here is the danger zone where the muscle is. You can see the striated muscle. And uh, if you put fat there, that's how the patient can die. So we're gonna stay above the deep gluteal fascia and uh, beneath the superficial gluteal fascia. And that's where you see Dr. Patino's cannula right here. It's a straight white line that he's wiggling. And then here we have the patient's skin. So this is the uh, subcutaneous space in which doctor will be putting fat. And I never had anybody die, just for the record, from any surgery, but especially this one. And so uh, look at the tip for the cannula and what's gonna happen now, Nicholas? We're gonna get a bolus. So that means that we're gonna see fat enter this space. So it looks like a little cloud. You see here, okay, so we got the cloud of fat coming in right here. And what we're gonna notice is see how the deep gluteal fascia is getting pushed down? That's because fat is entering this space. And actually the tip is on this side here. So we have the fat right here, and it's getting pushed down as fat comes into the space. So this is the intergluteal uh, crease uh, incision, and it's relatively safe because the sacrum protects, but we still want to, especially here, you want to use the ultrasound. Why? Because the, the gluteal veins, inferior and superior gluteal veins are right in this area, so we're going right into them, but they're deeper. So uh, we'll do an under ultrasound, and I confirm that I am looking at the ultrasound, and look at the beautiful, yellow fat that we're gonna put in and let's turn over there to ultrasound in a second thank you and now we have a wonderful image of dr patino's cannula here we go right here he's gonna wiggle it for us this is the tip and this is the superficial gluteal fascia so you can see we're underneath it but we're above the deep gluteal fascia so this is the space in which doctor can put the fat nicholas and how can, can how can the doctors tell which one is the superficial gluteal fascia besides the position what is a characteristic thing so like you said position is obviously the the most obvious thing right that it's about you know that deep more or less here but another characteristic is that there's a divide in it so it's broken into two little layers uh, and it's usually split where where the deep uh, gluteal fascia is not broken it doesn't no have the deep gluteal fascia is a very clear yeah. uh, clear line right here that you can see and then it has the striated muscle underneath it very good very good so I'm gonna withdraw the cannula and so you can see as I withdraw it right there you see the tip all right now yeah. I'm gonna give it a bolus look at that tip right there the bolus. all right so you see how from the tip now we have this cloud of gray uh, that is the fat that's entering the space and pushing down on the deep fascia. Thank you.